LGBT activists have a political agenda to reorganize the society to make sexual orientation a minority status which is protected by law. They wish to have new laws passed which will punish anyone who does not conduct all public activities as if homosexual and heterosexual behaviors are the same in every way. For example, your favorite gospel singer who performs for hire at a gospel concert will be punished if he refuses to be similarly hired for a gay pride event. Their agenda is formed and developed in a secular worldview that says there is no God, and if there is no God, there can be no absolute right or wrong. Now, sexual orientation has three components, attraction, identity, and behavior. The secular worldview denies the very existence of deviant or perverted attraction, identity, or behavior, and in so doing, fundamentally changes the way that sexual orientation is evaluated. These secular concepts have now become standard medical opinions. Therefore, homosexual attraction is as normal as heterosexual attraction and activities such as fisting, felching, rimming, farming, scat, chariot races, and other deviant behaviors are now to be considered normal and positive aspects of human sexuality. These dangerous, unnatural, and unhealthy intimate behaviors account in significant part for the high rates of HIV and other STIs among men who have sex with men. The value system in which every intimate behavior is accepted as normal and positive aspects of human sexuality is called moral nihilism. LGBT activists are using two strategies to advance their agenda, rights and public health. Let us look at rights. After the significant human rights abuses during World War II, including mass murder, the United Nations was formed and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was implemented on December 10, 1948 to protect fundamental human rights for all human beings. We all empathize with the concept of respecting each other's human rights. Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has a theistic or God-based underpinning. The United Nations system produces two types of documents, treaties and resolutions. A UN treaty is an agreement arrived at after prolonged negotiation between representatives of the governments of countries, which are called in the UN system nation state. Now, if a country signs a UN treaty, it agrees to bring its local laws in line with its obligation under that treaty. In other words, a UN treaty is binding on countries and is a basis for international law. Major United Nations treaties are negotiated on the idea that there are fundamental basic human rights that we are all supposed to recognize. These fundamental rights cannot be created by individuals or nation states. We are born with them. For example, the right to life and freedom of conscience. No UN treaty mentions or discusses rights based on sexual orientation. The other document produced by the United Nations is a resolution. Unlike a treaty, a resolution is not binding on countries. And therefore, they do not have to change their local laws, even if they have signed the resolution. Honestly, I don't really think people are born homosexual. Some turn homosexual because of wants, while some just because they don't feel love or anything but a family member, so they go out and tend to search for love from others, they get trapped. A young man is born, he's innocent, etc. I think it's a lifestyle that one lives. I don't think anybody is born gay, it's just that they, they choose to go that way with their sexual preferences. No auntie, they're not born that way. I just because wants and need and they're ready. I. They're not born that way. God don't make nobody like that. From my opinion, they do it from their young and they grow up in it. 
but they should keep it to their self. I don't think they were born that way, it's their choice, it's their sexual preference. No, they're not born that way, it's their option to choose. You see, maybe don't born that way, but uh, you see, develop from even prison. Well, <laughs> at first, I never think that they were born that way, you know, but when I went in psychology class, they taught me that they can have some kind of genes. No, they're not born that way, because God don't make the body just the mind. And things make people do certain things because sometimes when they cannot afford certain things and you don't want to work, you end up that lead us to it. In my opinion, no. Um, homosexuality to me, um, it has to be introduced. It's more, it's more um, psychological than it is um, natural. LGBT activists manipulate the processes involved in the production of international laws in the following ways. One. They unilaterally, that is on their own, claim that they have rights to same-sex intimate behavior. This is the rights by stealth or sneaky rights approach, claiming that a right exists when one does not. They repeat the claim that they have rights frequently, and this repetition causes the public to believe that the rights actually exist when they do not. Thirdly, they interpret UN treaties in a manner in which they were never intended to be interpreted at the time they were agreed upon. They used the claim that there was a gay gene to gain sympathy for their cause, suggesting that they were born with it and that gay is in fact the new black. But today, having accomplished their political agenda in developed countries, even LGBT activists acknowledge that no gay gene exists. Actually, the American Psychology Association indicates that the reasons for the development of sexual orientation are poorly understood, and that many factors, biological, psychological, and social, are involved in the process. Now, even if someone is born with a tendency, it does not mean that society must accept it as normal, when the acting out of that tendency may be harmful to the individual and the society. To summarize, Gay rights activists are aggressively seeking to interpret United Nations treaties in a manner which reflect their desires. They have hijacked the concept of fundamental human rights and want us to interpret them from a framework of absolute personal autonomy and moral nihilism. This wholesale autonomy is also a part of the secular worldview. In other words, in this view, everyone does what is right in his own eyes, no matter how bizarre the activity. LGBT activists claim that nations who retain the Bobbery Law are in violation of their rights as LGBT persons. It is said that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Therefore, it is critically important that Jamaicans remain watchful for these stealthy attempts at inventing new rights. If buggery was made legal in Jamaica, would that decrease HIV in men who have sex with men? No, sir. He's a more higher. Everybody that they have. No, that not real. It's about bring out more HIV, more HIV and sickness and disease. Because if a next man penetrating a next man, that is both so wicked, can cause a health mash up, mash up, mash up. You know, like them so much, eh? I doubt that because um, home, um, well, basically HIV is, is sparked from what human nature, the need to feel pleasure and and um, also of um, unprotected sex. So, if you introduce that, I don't think I would reduce it. If anything, probably would increase it. Um, it, um, spe that's a, a fundamental mistake would have made because if men know that um, anal sex is high risk for person to contract HIV, I don't think um. The law should be what um, what is really holding them back from going to be checked, utilize a condom. The, the, the law have nothing to do with it in Jamaica. I think um, this worldwide um, thing, collaborative thing, where lobby groups for lesbian and gays um, keep on asking for all the countries to be tolerated of it. I don't think it makes sense. Just because of HIV, the law should be put aside to accommodate it now. The second strategy that LGBT activists use is to claim that countries need to remove their buggery laws in order to decrease HIV AIDS among men who have sex with men. 
because sodomy or buggery laws prevent men who have sex with men from getting HIV tests, condoms, and treatments. The AIDS Free World Internet publication of October 26, 2010, showed that there is a big difference in the HIV rates in Jamaica between men who have sex with men and the general population of 32% compared to 1.6%. AIDS Free World blamed the fact that Jamaica still has a buggery law for this huge difference. The Gleaner of Thursday, September 16, 2010, quoted Dr. Ernest Messiah, director of UNAIDS Caribbean Regional Support Team, as saying, and I quote, the stigma associated with HIV is linked to prejudice and rejection of what is perceived and judged as abnormal sexual behavior and wrongful sexual orientation. It is precisely these stigmas that threaten the public's health. End of quote. Note carefully that he is suggesting in order to fight HIV, we must accept all sexual activities as equally good and healthy. But is there evidence to support this claim? And is this approach used for any other disease? Let us examine the medical data. Fact one. In 2007, Singapore, after parliamentary review, decided to keep its buggery law for men. Yet men who have sex with men in Singapore have a low prevalence rate of 2.6% for HIV infections. Mexico, which removed its buggery law in 1871, has a 25% prevalence rate among men who have sex with men. Fact two, France removed this buggery law in 1791, over 200 years ago, and in 2000 was said by the World Health Organization to have the best healthcare system in the world. France has a prevalence rate for men who have sex with men that is higher than Singapore varying between 12 to 17 percent. A study published by The Lancet, a most prestigious medical journal, reviewing new cases of HIV among men who have sex with men, heterosexuals, and intravenous drug users in France, reported that HIV was out of control among men who have sex with men. There were 1,006 new cases of HIV per 100,000 per year for men who have sex with men compared to nine per 100,000 per year for heterosexuals. In light of what Dr. Messiah said and what we know about France, we need to ask the question, is there still stigma and prejudice in France over 200 years after the Bugri law was repealed? Or do we look, need to look for the real reason for the HIV rates in men who have sex with men? Could it have something to do with the fact that the anus the lower end of the intestine is not a sexual organ. In 2011, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States reported HIV and other sexually transmitted infections have been increasing among men who have sex with men for over two decades. But more importantly, they say this has occurred despite considerable social, political, and human rights advances. Fact four, in July 2012, an article in the Lancet acknowledged that the only group in the world among whom HIV rates have been increasing, irrespective of the income levels of the country's studies, is men who have sex with men. The above evidence shows that removal of the buggery law is neither necessary nor sufficient for decreasing the prevalence of HIV among men who have sex with men. When we wish to control heart attacks or high blood pressure, we identify the activity that carries the highest risk for the illness, and we discourage that activity. Criticism or disapproval of salt eating or smoking is not punished. Instead, we discourage unhealthy behavior because it not only harms those who practice it, but also causes a drain on the country's resources. Why then are we taking a different approach for HIV? Jamaica spent $592 million for HIV prevention between 2009 and 2011. How can we then fight for acceptance and approval of acts that increase the risk of infection at great cost to the nation? So, to summarize, 
LGBT activists are using two strategies to advance their agenda. The first, the trick of inventing rights and pretending that Jamaica is obligated to observe them. The second is the falsehood that we need to accept unnatural and unhealthy behaviors to control HIV among men who have sex with men. The goals of these strategies, the LGBT agenda, are sexual anarchy in the context of oh, moral okay. nihilism and autonomy of the hold individual. On, hold on, okay. hold that on. is. Try it on, on this thing. Don't move, Mickey. I am a brother. <laughs> Salute. Yeah, man, me kind of. Oh, pause the video. To have no rules or restrictions on sexual acts. And secondly, to stifle disapproval or criticisms of these acts by using the law to punish dissenters. Homosexual can't write homosexual wrong from birth, it's not the Bible. Well, in my own view, I think it's illegal, I'm not sure. If it remains within the, the, the sect of people that, um, that practice it, and they are not imposing it on anyone openly, then I think they should be allowed to do what they want to do. Well, I'm not aware if it's illegal. No, I don't think it, um, I don't, um, the culture of Jamaica will not accept it. Even if the legislation is put in place, the, the, um, the power that be cannot compel the, um, the culture of Jamaica um, to accept this in the society. I'm not sure, you know, but to see other people like doing it in public, it's atrocious. It can't be legal. I would not going to make it legal. Because I would like to see a man to my son and rape him off and thing. If you make the Bogre law legal, as in legal for somebody to have sex with another, it means that you're giving persons consent to get an STI or HIV because that's where the prevalence is and that's where most of the time that's where it is contracted and then spread from. How did we get here? How did some nations get to this point where there is now a push for same-sex marriage? We will look at the journey in other countries and its impact on the citizens of those countries. Previously, all of these countries had sodomy or bogger laws. In England, the change began in 1957 when a government-sponsored committee, commonly referred to as the Wolfenden Committee, recommended that homosexual behavior between consenting adults in private should no longer be a criminal offense. Ten years later, in 1967, the Bogle Law was repealed. Then in 1998, in order to prevent the promotion of homosexuality in government-funded schools, Section 28 of the Local Government Act was passed. However, that law came under pressure from homosexual groups, leading to its repeal in 2003. In 2006, the Equality Act was passed, followed in 2007 by the Sexual Orientation Regulations, passed pursuant to the Equality Act. These regulations prohibit discrimination in the provision of goods, facilities, services, education, and public functions on the ground of sexual orientation. What the regulations have actually done is to force persons to treat the homosexual lifestyle as being normal, with punishment for those who do not comply. 
let us look at what this has meant for England. Well, even before the sexual orientation regulations were passed, the law was being interpreted in favor of the homosexual cause. Let me use the story of 69-year-old Harry Hammond to illustrate this point. In 2001, Hammond was beaten by a group of 30 to 40 persons while preaching. He was arrested for breach of the public order. The allegation was that he had displayed a sign which was threatening, abusive, or insulting. The sign actually read, Jesus gives peace. Jesus is alive. Stop immorality. Stop homosexuality. Stop lesbianism. Jesus is Lord. His attackers were not charged. Instead, they were the witnesses in the case. The court found him guilty and ordered him to pay a fine along with costs. Or maybe, if you could find Eunice and Owen Johns, who had fostered children 15 times before, they would tell you how shocked they were when in 2009, they were not allowed to foster a child all because they could not endorse homosexuality as being normal and good. They had a rude awakening. Then again, you may want to ask Leslie Pilkington, a counselor who in 2012 was demoted because she dared to make her services available to an undercover journalist posing as a man who said he was struggling with unwanted same-sex desires. He then reported her to a professional association who stripped her of her senior accredited status. You see, you need to understand that in many of these countries, the right to privacy has been twisted to provide legal protection for consensual homosexual activity. Yet, in those same countries, it would appear that this right to privacy does not extend to counseling private between two consenting adults. England's journey, which began with allowing consenting adults to do what they want in private, is at the point where the state has now become an agent of the homosexual agenda by requiring the public to stop the homosexual lifestyle with the seal of approval. Now let's examine what has happened in Canada. In 1969, the Pierre Trudeau government decided to repeal their sodomy laws. You will recall that was Pierre Trudeau who uttered the infamous words, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. In 1982, Canada adopted a Charter of Rights. Then in 1999, same-sex civil unions were declared legal by the Supreme Court. The Minister of Justice, Anne McLennan, tried to placate the Canadian people by saying that the definition of marriage would not be affected by this ruling of the courts. Yet, six years later, the Canadian Parliament legitimized These imaginary situations that you just heard about are now a reality in many countries. And there is a serious committed attempt to make them a reality in Jamaica as well. Well, that is if Jamaicans do nothing to stop it. Now, this whole process of reorganization, of turning all our concepts of right and wrong, normal and abnormal, or even legal and illegal, upside down. This whole process is being attempted in the name of human rights. No, we all agree. Every human being everywhere in the world has what we call fundamental human rights. These rights are not the gift of the United Nations. No government can give them to you. These rights are given to every human being by our creator. Some examples of these include the right to life or the right to free speech, 
for the right to conscience or the right to your religion. <laughs> I guess we all will agree that the right to life is the most important of all of these because you will never hear a dead person arguing about any of the other rights. They're meaningless. No. The importance of recognizing fundamental human rights really came to international attention with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in December of 1948. Why 1948? Because before this, during the Second World War, there were some horrible abuses of human rights. And the persons who signed that declaration determined that this kind of abuse should never happen again. But what is a right? A right is an entitlement. It is an entitlement on the basis of which you make a claim. For example, when I say I have a right to life, my claim is that I am entitled to my life and no one can simply arbitrarily take it. Now, every time you hear someone say, I have a right, you ask yourself, is that a real right? And what entitlement are they claiming based on that right? And what demands are they going to make of me if that is a right? Now, in this presentation, you're going to hear a lot about rights. You're going to hear how some persons are using human rights to change the reality in Jamaica. But it's not the rights I spoke about earlier, not the fundamental human rights, no. It's some new rights. They are creating new rights. But these new rights are going to have serious claims on the society, on you and on me. They are going to have serious claims about what we can do under the law, what we can say under the law, and what we can allow our children to be taught. So, we talk about law. How is law linked to rights, though? Well, one of the functions of the law, if you think about it, is this. The law decides how citizens in a country operate so that they don't trample on each other's rights. So, if you murder someone, the law says you'll be punished because that person has a right to their life. You cannot arbitrarily take someone's life simply because they are inconvenient for you. But who decided that that should be a law? Where, where did that law come from that murder should be punished? Well, no law comes out of thin air. And no country's laws arise in a vacuum. No, not at all. Every law is based on a philosophy. Every law is based on a set of ideas about how the world operates. So, if we are thinking about keeping a law, or making a law, or changing a law, what we really need to think about is, what set of ideas is that law based on? And furthermore, if those are the ideas that are going to operate in our society, what will our society look like? These ideas, this philosophy, it could be called a worldview. And in the next section, worldviews are what we are going to be talking about. What is a worldview? A set of fundamental beliefs by which we live our lives, whether we are aware of it or not. Everyone has a worldview. Everyone. Essentially, there are two main worldviews, although people pull from both in order to look at the world in different ways. For the purposes of this presentation, I will be focusing on these two opposing worldviews, the secular worldview, meaning there is no God, and the theistic worldview, meaning there is a God. Jamaican law and that of other Western democracies have been based on a theistic worldview. Presently, there's a determined effort to replace the theistic worldview with a secular worldview. We are going to go through six essential questions to show the difference between these worldviews so that you can consider which worldview has the best outcome for society. Let's look at the answers to these questions. First, what is the truth about the beginning of the universe? Or was there even a beginning? The secular worldview says the universe always was, always is, and always will be. There is no creator. 
On the other hand, the theistic worldview says there is a creator. The Bible states, in the beginning, God. In other words, there is a creator. Second, how do we know what is right and what is wrong? In a secular worldview, man decides what is best. He comes to the truth of what is right or wrong by his reason alone. In a theistic worldview, we know what is right and wrong by looking at God's character. What is right is grounded in God's character, which is good. Third, what is the truth about human beings? Who are we and how did we get here? The secular worldview says we are just here by chance, chemical accidents, evolved from animals, and as such are really just higher animals. The theistic worldview states that we are made in the image of God. We have personality, we are self-conscious, and we have free will. Fourth, how many genders are there? With a secular worldview, gender is simply a matter of how you feel. For example, in the morning, you can identify yourself as a man, and at night, that same man can identify as a woman. The Australian Human Rights Commission, in a document entitled Protection from Discrimination on the Basis of Sexual Orientation and Sex and or Gender Identity, has actually proposed some 23 genders. The theistic worldview says there are simply two, male and female. Fifth, what is a marriage? The secular worldview provides for any combination of numbers or genders to qualify as marriage. On the other hand, the theistic worldview holds that marriage is an exclusive union between one man and one woman. Sixth, does truth exist and can it be known? The secular worldview states that there is no absolute truth, whilst the theistic worldview affirms that truth exists, truth can be known. Truth is what conforms to reality. Stop and think about this question. Can it be absolutely true that there is no absolute truth? Now that we have looked at the secular and theistic worldview, stop and ask yourself another question. Of these opposing worldviews, which is safer and better? to use as a basis for our laws so that the dignity of all human beings can be protected. Worldviews, you don't leave home without one. So Kevin, how's school? Well, school all right. A couple courses we may study up for and thing, but you know, it's all right. So how's the family? <laughs> Well, you know, my dad already, you know, everybody cool, but my dad, you know, same crazy and thing. Yeah. yeah, so, by the way, were you at the lecture on the worldview the other day? Oh, yeah, man, yeah, 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 yeah. Yo, it sound good, but what it really have to do with my life? Well, you see, the first thing you have to do is look at what a worldview is. Essentially, a worldview is how you look at the world and how you... In